to you, O Lord. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there was named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down, and he was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, just as a reminder, last week, we heard Jesus tell a story about a tax collector. And last week when we heard that parable about a tax collector, I described him as a classic villain, a traitor who colluded with Israel's enemy, Rome, a self-serving bureaucrat who profited off of others. In the story that Jesus told, this parable we heard last week, the tax collector went to the temple to pray for God's mercy. And despite all the wrong that he had done, God gave him mercy. But that was just a parable. That was a theoretical tax collector. Today's gospel story features a real tax collector. And now we get to see what happens when God, incarnate in the person Jesus, comes face to face with such a villain. Will he avoid him? Will he scold him? Will he punish him? Well, it turns out that what Jesus does is invite him, and then he transforms him. The tax collector's name is Zacchaeus. It means pure or innocent, but he probably wasn't. The text says that he's rich, and because he's a tax collector, we might imagine that he's gotten his wealth by charging others a fee on top of the taxes that he is collecting from them. But he's interested in Jesus. He hurries to go see him, he climbs a tree to get a better view, and he waits anxiously for Jesus to come by. And yet, it isn't Zacchaeus who calls out to Jesus. It's the other way around. Jesus invites him. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I am coming to your house today. Well, Zacchaeus is thrilled. This is more than he could have hoped for. Not only a glimpse of Jesus, but an audience with him as well. Even the chance to host him at his home. What an honor. Well, in the story about the theoretical tax collector that Jesus told, a Pharisee was also at the temple that day, a Pharisee, a good, observant Jew, and he grumbled about the tax collector's presence in the temple. How can an unrighteous man like that come and stand before God? Well, in the real life story, Zacchaeus, his good Jewish neighbors, they react no differently. How can Jesus choose the table of a sinner to dine at? They grumble. They're offended by Zacchaeus, by Jesus, perhaps by both. How many times throughout Jesus' ministry have people asked him, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I will give you a clue, it is more than once. Jesus gets asked that question a lot because it deeply bothers people to see Jesus so intimately kind towards the worst of society. But just as the, as the Pharisee missed the miracle of God's mercy for the tax collector in Jesus' parable, so the neighbors are missing the miracle of transformation that Jesus is bringing about in Zacchaeus' life. Because after this encounter with Jesus, he is changed. Jesus invites him, and then Jesus transforms him. Zacchaeus tells Jesus that he's divesting from his own wealth. Half of his goods he's giving away. Not half of his money, not half of his savings, but half of his everything. 
And then he tells Jesus that if he has defrauded anyone, he will pay them back fourfold. That word defrauded, in Greek it's a complex one. In the Greco-Roman culture, those for whom this word was used were essentially informants. They were informing on their neighbors, exposing their neighbors. The implication was that sometimes they extorted money from people who were willing to bribe them rather than be exposed. Sounds just like a tax collector, doesn't it? This is not a flattering word. Zacchaeus is admitting that he has indeed made his wealth off of the vulnerability of his neighbors. But he wants to change that. He wants to change his behavior. What's more, he wants to make reparations, not just pay back his ill-gotten gains, but pay back fourfold with a generous donation of half his possessions on top of that. It is hard to imagine that Zacchaeus would offer all of this unless his heart had been deeply changed. What an authentic model of repentance. He knows he's lost. And he knows that that means Jesus is coming after him, searching for him, ready to carry him back to the fold like a helpless, lost sheep. That is Jesus' model of repentance, the lost being found and brought home to God. You don't have to be good already to earn God's mercy. You are given God's mercy. And then in response, you grow in faithfulness. Learn to do good, the prophet Isaiah implores. We heard that in our first reading today. Learn to do good. Seek justice. It's a process, not something done all at once. And it's done in relationship with God. Again, we heard this from Isaiah today. Come, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Come, let us argue it out. What a line to find in our scriptures spoken to us by God. God is willing to argue it out with you, willing to engage with you about your faith journey, willing to talk with you about how you can be growing in faithfulness, willing to listen to you about what challenges you and impedes you. When we hear Lutherans talk about scripture as law and gospel, this is the role of law that God will show us where we are wandering astray of God's way. And God will invite us back, just as Jesus invited Zacchaeus. God will sit with us at the table, just as Jesus dined with Zacchaeus. God will argue it out with us, teach us about our wrongdoing, and then God will transform us, just as Jesus did with Zacchaeus. God's mercy is already there. We don't earn it through our repentance. Remember when Jesus teaches about repentance, he describes it as lost ones being found. Not lost ones reforming their behavior, not lost ones finding their own way back, not lost ones earning back respect. God's mercy is a gift freely offered just as it was to the tax collector in Jesus' parable who prayed, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Did that tax collector change his behavior? The parable doesn't say, but it does say that he went home restored to right relationship with God. God found him for that moment at least, and God will never stop looking for him if he wanders away again. And then in this story from this morning about Zacchaeus, we hear that God's mercy does not end at forgiveness. God's mercy also transforms. It changes our lives, alters our direction, calls us into ever greater faithfulness. That's the point of discipleship, to stay on the journey with God, to keep growing and learning and seeking. Well, today, right here in this holy place, we will get to experience two very powerful reminders of God's abundant mercy and God's loving transformation. We call these sacraments. They are reminders of God's free grace. So here's the first one. A little baby will come to be baptized. 
Now, this little baby, she hasn't read any books about theology. She hasn't prayed any sincere prayers of contrition. She hasn't completed a rigorous course in catechism. She hasn't done anything because she's just a baby, a beloved child of God. And that's all she needs to be in order to qualify for this mercy. She doesn't even have to be able to walk herself up to the font. She can be carried. Well, this is one reason why Lutherans allow for infant baptism. Sometimes people ask, well, why baptize them before they can understand what's happening? Well, I would answer, because they don't need to understand. This isn't a cognitive test. It's a gift. It's a physical reminder of God's unearned mercy. And I will tell you what, you could live 150 years and still not cognitively understand God's grace. So Juniper will come up, she'll be carried up, and she'll receive this reminder of God's grace already offered to her before she can even comprehend it. But that's not the end of it. Another reason to baptize little babies is the recognition that faith is a lifelong journey. It has already started, even for this sweet little baby. God is already seeking her, finding her, holding her, carrying her. And we hope that she'll spend her whole life holding on to that truth. So at her baptism, we will make some promises to her, particularly all of you who come with her. We will make promises to raise her up in the faith, to bring her to worship, to teach her about prayer and scripture. We promise to pray for her, even before she can pray herself. We promise to remember our own baptisms and to recommit to our shared mission in Christ together. That's discipleship. The encounter with Jesus leaves you changed, and you are ever after being made new, over and over again, your whole life growing into Christ. So here's the second sacrament that we'll participate in today, the table. You don't have to understand this one either. Christ's presence at this meal is a grace-filled mystery, but one that Jesus himself promised. Jesus said that when we share this meal of remembrance, that he would be here, and he is. Jesus said that when we broke bread and poured this wine, it would nourish our spirits for the lifelong journey of faith, and it does. And you don't have to do anything to qualify for this meal. Just like Juniper doesn't have to do anything to qualify for baptism, you are a beloved child of God, and that's all you need. You don't have to believe a certain set of doctrines. You don't have to tithe a certain percentage of your income. You don't have to have fixed all your past mistakes. You come to this table as a sinner, just like Zacchaeus came to that dinner with Jesus. You can pray, Lord, have mercy on me, just like the tax collector who went to the temple. And God says, yes, there is mercy here for you. You too can come and be fed. Everyone can come and be fed. But I do hope that you come to this table listening. Listen for God's voice, for God's guidance, for God's invitation. Come, let us argue it out. Listen for God showing you where to take the next step, how to make the next change in your life. You come to this table as you are, as often as you can. It is always here for you. But when you leave, know that you are becoming what you eat, the body of Christ. A meal with Christ will transform you. Zacchaeus can attest to that. God will never stop inviting you. God will never stop transforming you. Thanks be to God. Amen.